in the back right out that door and off to the side for middle school, high school, for toddlers, for elementary school, pretty much if you're under the age of 18, there's something back there for you. Um, or you can just stay in here, whatever you prefer. We're going to be continuing our series today that has officially become my least favorite series to preach um, because there's a lot of awkward subjects you have to talk about. There's a lot of potentially difficult subjects you have to talk about, um, but it's important. We've been talking about marriage for the last two weeks. We'll talk about it today, and uh, next week, it's on to something new. Uh, actually, next week, normally I don't tell you when I'm not going to be here because I don't want people to be like, oh, the pastors are not going to be there, so I'm not going to. Well, I'm going to be gone next week, but Brandy's going to be speaking, and here's why you should be here, okay? Because there's this award, went to the same college, I don't know if you guys knew that or not, and there's this award that's given in every class to the best public speaker in the class. I didn't win my year. She won hers. Okay? So if you guys can tolerate me, you're going to really enjoy when Brandy's up here. So you should be here next week. She's going to be talking about what we're going to be doing to benefit the next generation, what the Bible says about our responsibility to our children and our children's children. It's going to be an amazing message. But today, we're talking about marriage. specifically. We're answering the third of our three questions. What do married people not do? Now, that's a big question. We're not going to entirely answer it today, but we're going to try to hit on some highlights, some big things that the Bible puts out there that married people should not do within their marriage. So here's how we're going to divide it up. First of all, we're going to talk about stuff that you shouldn't do. Second of all, we're going to talk about divorce specifically. When is it okay? When is it not? What does the Bible say about it? And third, we're going to talk about remarriage. What if you're widowed? What if you're divorced? What does the Bible say about remarriage? And I know some of these are going to be some really heavy subjects. Please bear with me. And I will say just a little bit of a word up front. When we get to remarriage, not only is it a difficult subject, but the Bible doesn't give us an explicit list of in these situations you may remarry and in these situations you cannot. So there's going to be a little bit of a, hey, this is my opinion, this is my interpretation. But if you are in a situation or have been in the past where you were looking to remarry after a failed marriage or whatever, uh, search the scriptures yourself and pray deeply. The conviction of the Holy Spirit on you and your understanding of Scripture is going to be, frankly, more important than my understanding of Scripture. You are God's servant every bit as much as I am. I'm not your master, neither are the elders, so do what is right before God to the best of your ability in difficult situations like that. Not just with remarriage, but frankly with any difficult and debatable situation. Search the Scriptures, ask what the Bible says, and do your best to do right before God in your own life. That is my best advice to you. I know that's kind of wishy-washy sounding, but uh, I don't want to stand up here on something I'm not 100% sure about and then say, thus saith the Lord, right? I don't want to put that on you guys. So with all of that aside, let's start off with things that the Bible says you should not do in a Christian marriage. The first one is, well, pretty blatantly stated that you should not separate, walk away from, or give up on your marriage for no reason. 1 Corinthians 7 Paul writes to, well, the Corinthian church and says this, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. He draws attention to that. This is not Paul's advice. Later on in the same chapter, he gives some advice that is not an explicit commandment to the, from the Lord. We looked at that last week. But he says specifically, this is not me. This is not Paul. This is from the Lord. He says, a wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Now there's a lot more discussion that goes on here, which we'll get into when we talk about divorce in the next section, because he does actually give an exception to this rule. But this is the general rule. All other things being equal, that divorce, separation, should not happen in a Christian marriage. Now, I know that's exceedingly difficult, because we grow up in a society, all of us, and it's been going on for decades, where divorce is a way out of a relationship that is no longer filling for many people. And that is simply not the way that Scripture lays out. Marriage is meant to be a permanent covenant between two people. And there's a small number of situations where that covenant is broken, where it's violated, that divorce is permitted. Again, we'll get into that in a little bit. But the general rule, all other things being equal, is if you are part of a marriage, you stay in the marriage. 
Maggie hates when I say this. I don't say it as often as I used to, but actually when we were engaged, I said it a few times, and she always said the same thing. That's not very romantic, Jason. Um, I would say this. I'd say, you know, I really think that marriage is less about love and more about commitment, which isn't very romantic, but I think it's accurate. Love, as we talk about it as Americans, is an emotion. It's a warm, fuzzy feeling. Do I love my wife? Yeah, she's awesome. Look at her. She's terrific. Have you talked to her? Because she's super smart, and she's kind, and she's a little bit fiery sometimes too, but so am I, and so we kind of get along. She's awesome. I do love her. I have emotions for her. But you guys that are married or have been married or even just have been in like a long-term relationship with someone, there are some times where that love, that warm, fuzzy feeling, it just ain't there. It's not. Maybe it's because you're tired. You're just worn out and that's all it is. You don't feel much of anything for anyone or anything. You just want to lay in bed. Sometimes it's that. It's that simple. Sometimes it's because you had a nasty fight. And look, if you live with someone long enough, you will sooner or later have a bad fight. It happens. But right at the end of that fight, it's pretty rare that you have those warm, fuzzy feelings for someone. Now, for some of us, unfortunately, and I hope this never happens, for those that are married or will be married in this congregation, I hope this never happens to you, but it happens to a lot of people. It's not just the one fight in a temporary period where you don't feel that emotion, but it becomes a long, drawn-out period. Maybe because there's chronic stress in your marriage. Maybe because finances are difficult. Maybe it's something else entirely. Maybe it's your in-laws or work or something. But there's something that affects your, the way that you're thinking, affects your emotions. And for a long period of time, you don't feel that warm, fuzzy feeling. We're not talking a couple days or even a couple weeks, maybe a couple months or a couple years. But the marriage covenant has not been broken. In a Christian marriage, that is not grounds for divorce. A wife must not separate from her husband. A husband must not divorce his wife. Now again, we'll get back into that a little bit later. But let's move on for the time being, at least to one exception that God gives. In Matthew 19, 9, Jesus himself says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Now, this exception, and again, we'll look at it again later, is given. So yes, there are some situations where divorce is permissible. But this is not walking away from a marriage. This is ending, formally, a marriage that has already been broken, a marriage that has already been violated by adultery. This is one exception. Again, we'll get into a few more later. 1 Peter 3.7 gives another thing that Christians should not do in their marriage, and well, it's easy to read over because of the way it's worded. Peter gives some instructions to married women, and then he says this to husbands, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, or many translations say, as the weaker vessel, since she is a woman and her, and uh, should Sorry, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now often, this verse gets taken out of context in certain church communities, and it bothers me, man. Because the way that that is phrased, right, often translated, because in the Greek it does say, as the weaker vessel. Live with her in an understanding way as the weaker vessel. And that word vessel is a term often used metaphorically to refer to someone's body. Literally what Peter is saying here is live with her in an understanding manner as someone who is physically weaker than you. There are a lot of women that can beat me up. Like, I'm just being honest with you. In the first century, it probably wasn't going to be the case. You did not have professional weightlifters. You did not have UFC. You did not have anything like that. If you were a woman, you were expected to remain at home, to take care of the home, to take care of the children. You did not have a lot of opportunities to grow them guns. The men would often go out and be, they'd be laborers, they'd be soldiers, they'd be farmers, they'd be whatever, they'd be doing physical things, especially if you're a lower class, which means you would be larger and stronger than your spouse. Another important thing to understand, less so with the Jewish community, but much more so with the Greco-Roman communities, is that men were permitted to beat their wives and were not forbidden by law from doing so, even in some cases to the point where they could kill their spouses and would not be tried in 
when Peter says, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone who is physically weaker, he's not saying women are of less value. He's not saying they're less intelligent. He's not saying any of that. He's saying, as a general rule, men are bigger and stronger than their wives, so you shouldn't hit them. That's what he's saying. What, was Peter, what did Peter do for a living before Jesus called him? Does anyone remember? He's a fisherman. And not like rod and reel. Big nets, heavy ropes, and you throw them out into the water, and then you had to pull them back by hand. You had some tools to help you out, but he was probably a pretty big, strong dude. So you have this big, burly fisherman, and he's married because Paul mentions his wife, right? So we know that he's married. When Peter is picturing your standard married couple, he's picturing himself, you know, big dude, strong dude, and he's picturing his wife, who's probably much smaller and weaker than him. And he's saying, if you're a Christian, you cannot abuse that difference in physical strength. Live with them as someone who is an heir of grace. In other words, God values your spouse, you should too. Now, I do feel careful expanding this a little bit, because in today's day and age, physical abuse, yes, it still happens. But I hope everyone in this room doesn't need to be told not to hit your spouse. But other forms of of abuse are somewhat more acceptable. We all know people that are just very quick with their tongues, right? They're just clever and they're smart and they can make these biting comments that just cut you down. If you're that kind of person, you have a strength that you can use against your spouse if you are not careful. Live with them in an understanding way. 1 Peter 3 is specifically a commandment against physical abuse. But the principle behind it is your spouse, be you male or female, your spouse is of equal value to you before God. They are an heir of the grace of life. God loves them. You should act like it. This is a commandment against abuse. So what should you not do in a Christian marriage? You should not abuse your spouse, physically, verbally, in any case. They are an heir of the grace of life. Act like it. The verse or the uh, line there at the end is really important too. Peter says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. And this seems kind of like out there. What does my behavior in my marriage have to do with my prayers? Well, there's a theme throughout the Old Testament prophets that when someone with power abuses someone without power, takes advantage of someone without power, that God will no longer listen to their prayers. The people are told, for example, in Amos, that God does not accept their worship and their sacrifices because they do not treat orphans and widows and foreigners with the respect they deserve because they take advantage of the poor. And as Amos puts it, he sells, or they sell them for uh, the thong of a sandal. Basically, you take advantage of people for anything that you can get out of them. And that's the same idea behind the verse here. That if you are abusing your spouse, if you are mistreating them in any way, that just like the people of Israel that the prophet Amos went to, God will not listen to your prayers so long as you can continue in that sin. And that's not me. That's Peter. 1 Peter 3, 7. There should not be any form of abuse in a Christian marriage. What else should there not be in a Christian marriage? Well, not just in a Christian marriage, but in any Christian relationship, a friendship, the relationship between a parent and a child, or a marriage. Whatever sort of relationship you have, there's some advice for it in Galatians chapter 5. Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. These are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I have forewarned you, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul here gives a list of a whole lot of different behaviors and character traits that Christians are not to have in any relationship, period. You're not to be envious. You're not to form factions against one another. You are not to uh, be defined by drunkenness or carousing. You shouldn't have outbursts of anger or selfish ambition. And here's the thing. If you look at this list, chances are there's at least one thing here that you're like, yeah, that's still a problem for me. And maybe not the worst version of it. Maybe when you have outbursts of anger, you're not throwing hands anymore. You left that behind when you were 18. But, you know, maybe you're still cutting. Selfish ambition. Are there any times you ever think of yourself over the needs of your spouse? Or your friend? Or your child? 
there's something on this list that you probably still struggle with. I know there's a few that I definitely do. But Paul gives an alternative. Because it's not enough to say, I won't do those things. You have to replace them with something. You have this bad behavior, a bad tendency. It's not enough to say, well, I'm just not going to do that anymore. You need to replace it with something else. So what do you replace it with? Well, he tells you in just the next couple verses. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then this summary statement. If we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit as well. In other words, your actions should reflect your faith. So not just in your marriage, but in any relationship that you have, which one of these lists are you going to represent more? And I'm not saying be perfect. Because I expect that every single one of us will fall short, and we'll probably fall short within the church context. We're going to see each other mess up. But are you going to represent this list more? Or are you going to be defined more by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruits of the Spirit? If you can honestly say that in the scale of your life, you are much more balanced on this side, every relationship in your life, including your marriage, will improve. After all, don't we all want people in our lives that are loving and joyful and peaceful? So in every relationship, choose the fruit of the Spirit, not the vices that Paul lists before. If we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit as well. 1 Peter 2, Peter uh, gives us another list of do-nots. And there's a particular emphasis in these that I think is really important. It's a good catch-all to keep in your mind if you want to think things that I should not do in my relationships with other people, including in my marriage. Peter says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Like newborn babies, long for pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And that first line, therefore rid yourselves of all malice. Malice is a good catch-all term. Let me define it for you. The word here, the Greek word as well as the English word, refers to a desire to hurt someone in any way, physically, emotionally, whatever. It refers to a desire to hurt someone. And every word afterwards is a way that you could hurt someone. You can hurt someone by lying. You can hurt someone by being hypocritical. You can hurt someone through envy. You can hurt someone through slander. And the list could be longer if Peter wanted to keep going. So if you are a Christian and you're asking, what are things I shouldn't do in my marriage? What are things I shouldn't do in my friendships? What are things I shouldn't do at the church? What are things I shouldn't do at work? Rid yourselves of all malice, all desire to hurt another person. And the reason why I love this as a catch-all is it almost has this implicit allowance for you're imperfect and you're going to mess up. Because malice is a desire to hurt someone. How often do you guys do something that hurts someone, but you really didn't mean to? You just didn't realize what you were doing. I know that I do. I assume that all of us do. Is that malice? No. You weren't desiring to. You just screwed up. You said something wrong. You did something wrong. You forgot to do something that you promised you would do, whatever it is. It's not malice wrong. You should apologize. It's not malice. If you want to catch all for what are things I should not do in any relationship as a Christian, rid yourself of malice. Never seek to harm another person. Start there and you can build on that foundation. Peter even gives us a solution for how to rid ourselves of these sorts of malice. He says, long for pure spiritual milk, which is a really weird phrase, but there's actually a little bit of a pun going on here. The Bible loves puns. I point that out a lot. That word for spiritual is logikon, similar to a word that some of you guys might know. In Greek, the word logos, which is used to refer to Jesus and to Scripture. And or Peter uses it, rather, in chapter 1 to refer to Scripture. This is a wink and a nod. It's a reference back. When he says pure spiritual milk, I believe that the original audience, when reading it or listening to it in the original language, would have caught that when he says logikon, he's talking about Scripture. It's the same root word that the church always used to refer to Scripture. Many translations, including the NIV, actually render it that way. They say long for the pure milk of the word or something along those lines. So you want to get rid of your malice. Step number one, long for the truths of Scripture. And it'll start you down that path. 
There's one last bit of general relationship advice here before we get into those other subjects. Matthew 18 gives us instructions for the restoration of relationships. In Matthew 18, Jesus himself says, now if your brother sins, or some translations say sins against you, we have manuscripts that say both. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take with you one or two more, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, he is to be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. This is a systematic way of resolving either when someone is in public sin and they need to be rebuked, or when someone has sinned against you. And you can use this in your marriage. You can use this in your friendships. You can use this in your relationships with the church. Now, I do want to say this is specifically for use with other Christians. This is instructions in Scripture for how to deal with issues with other Christians. They say, first, go to the person one-on-one and say, you did this, it hurt me, or you're doing this, and while it doesn't affect me personally, it's definitely sinful and you need to stop. And if they listen to you, awesome, you have gained your brother. You've restored them, that's it. But if they don't listen to you, then take two or three others. This is alluding to a Jewish tradition where you would take uh, older, mature individuals, often elders of the town that you were living in, with you, so that they could establish what you were saying was true. Basically, so the person couldn't just be like, ah, no, I'm not listening to you because that's just your opinion. You bring a few other mature, respected people with you, and they can say, no, this is really a problem and we need to fix it. And if they don't listen even to your small group, then you bring it to the church. Now, if we take that very literally, it means you stand up on a Sunday and say, this person sins, shame on them. And there are churches that do that. I'm not sure that's what's meant here. I mean, if you want to do it that way, it's just going to get real awkward. I think this means, and this is purely my interpretation, so I could definitely be wrong. I think this means bring it to the leadership of the church. In our case, bring it to the elders. If people don't listen to you and they don't listen to one or two respected members of the community, then bring it to the people who have been given responsibility over the church. Part of their responsibility is to handle situations like this. If someone is openly in sin, if someone has hurt someone and refuses to repent or apologize for it, Bring it to the church. And what happens if they won't even listen to the church or to the leadership of the church? Well, you're to disfellowship them. Treat them as a Gentile or tax collector. They can no longer be a part of your community because they're in open and unrepentant sin. This doesn't mean that you do the Amish thing where you like don't talk to them and they like cease to exist. There's some Christian communities that do that, but it means they can no longer partake in things like your service. They can no longer serve in your church. They no longer partake in communion until they repent. Once they repent, they are to be restored. Now, maybe this exact method doesn't work in your marriage because maybe it's not an issue of like sin, like someone has actually sinned, but it's just a disagreement that you can't get past. And no one's really sinning, but you're just fighting, you know? Maybe it's that. So maybe it starts with you just going one on one, and then you adapt the method a little bit because it's not a sin issue. It's not quite what Jesus is talking about. So maybe at that point, you bring in someone respected that's a part of your family that maybe is a part of the disagreement, someone that you know can kind of be the arbitrator. And maybe if that doesn't work, then you go to a marriage counselor instead. But this three-step process can still be a very helpful framework to handle disagreements, whether it's in your marriage or friendships or wherever. So if someone sins against you, if someone does something to you, use this method and seek restoration. Now the really fun part. Let's talk about divorce. I'm going to do my best to try to say this is what the Bible says and then move on, but understand divorce and remarriage are things that are very hotly debated in the church. I'm going to, for the most part, just be voicing my understanding to the best of my knowledge of the scriptures. But again, search the scriptures yourself. If you're in a situation where these rules apply, search the scriptures yourself. Pray deeply. Seek out people whose spiritual insights you trust. Ultimately, you're not my servant, you're God's, and anything that you do, you have to answer to him, not to me. Again, Matthew 19, this time with an extra verse beforehand, Jesus' instructions on divorce. He says, because of your hardness of heart, speaking to, to Pharisees, to teachers of the law of the Jewish people, he says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, Genesis, Garden of Eden, like we did the first week, right? From the beginning, it was not this way. 
I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So the only exception Jesus gives here is if you are cheated on. But it's kind of a broad definition of cheat because the word here is not the word for adultery specifically. It's the word for any sort of sexual immorality. The word is porneia, which is a word, a prefix we still use in English. So any form of sexual immorality, then yes, you may divorce. But that's the only exception that Jesus gives. But things get a little bit weird when you get to 1 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul writes, and he gives this advice to Christians in the city of Corinth. He's talking about a couple in this situation where the wife is a Christian and the husband is not. And he says, if the unbelieving spouse, if the husband is willing to remain married, you should remain married. But if the unbelieving one is leaving, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases or is not bound to that person. They're not restrained by their marriage vows. But God has called us to live in peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So Paul here gives another exception, a situation where being separated or divorced is, is acceptable. If your spouse abandons you, specifically if your spouse abandons you because of your faith. So isn't Paul contradicting Jesus? Because Jesus says only in cases of sexual immorality, and then Paul says, well, I, if you have an unbelieving spouse and your spouse leaves you, then you are not bound. I think the thing we have to understand here is often when rabbis taught, and Jesus was God and man, yes, but his career field, he was a rabbi. He was trained to teach as a Jewish rabbi. Rabbis used hyperbole and absolute statements in situations to make a point when it wasn't exclusively, uh, when it wasn't, 100% 100% accurate. That's a bad way of phrasing it. But there are other situations where Jesus makes an absolute statement that is blatantly not true. And I think that's because the people that heard it, they're used to hearing teaching from rabbis, and they would have understood he's making a point. right? We use hyperbole a lot, and we understand that when we use the hyperbole, people get what we're saying. Like if I let's say we've been working a lot uh, at our house on our on this outbuilding on our property trying to get it ready because Brandy's going to be moving in there, and uh, and say that I spend eight hours out there, and I can tell Maggie when she gets home, man, I spent all day out there. Well, day's twenty four hours, and I wasn't up at one a.m. So obviously I didn't spend all day out there, but I spent a long time out there. So I say, man, I spent all day out there, right? And I just understand like she's going to get that. I don't mean I spent a twenty four hour period in that building and never left or ate or drank or used the bathroom, right? You can understand that. Jesus does very similar things. Hyperbole and overstatement, these are just ways that we talk. Here's an example that's pretty easy for us to see where Jesus is using an absolute statement that is definitely not absolute. He's in his hometown Nazareth teaching, and the scriptures say this, they, that is the crowd, took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not dishonored except in his own hometown and in his own household. That's an absolute statement. So if we take Jesus literally, the only place that a prophet is not respected is in their hometown and by their own family. Trivia question real quick. Um, Jesus was born in Nazareth. Where was he executed? Jerusalem. Was he born in Jerusalem? He was born kind of nearby. He definitely wasn't raised there. His hometown was Nazareth. Generally speaking... Being executed is not a respectful action, especially when the crowds pressure the government into executing you despite the fact that the governor says that you haven't done anything wrong, which is what happens with Jesus. So either Jesus is wrong and a prophet is disrespected in other places. He was certainly disrespected in Jerusalem. Or this statement was never meant to be understood as absolute. I think it's I think when people heard this, they'd understand he's making a point. And yes, there are exceptions to it, but he's making a rhetorical point. He's using hyperbole and overstatement to make a point. And I think the same thing is happening when he mentions divorce. 
the point he's making being you cannot divorce for any old reason, but there are some exceptions such as adultery. And that's why Paul can come back later fully confident with the approval of the other apostles and say, hey, you can also be separated from your spouse if they abandon you. Now, because of that, I come to this stance. Again, this is my interpretation. Search the scriptures yourself. Pray deeply. Talk to people that you trust that know their scriptures well. I think divorce is permitted when the marriage covenant has already been broken by abandonment, by adultery, or some other form of sexual immorality. And maybe we could add other things to the list. Physical abuse. Is that a violation of the marriage covenant? I would think so. It is not mentioned in scripture. I think if there is a situation where the marriage covenant has been broken, then divorce is permissible. Not required, but permissible. So what about a divorced or a widowed person? Can they get remarried? This is really where I'm going to try and tread carefully, okay? A widowed person, can they be remarried? Yes, 1 Timothy 5.14. Therefore, this is Paul writing to his protege, Timothy. Therefore, I want, he says specifically, younger widows, to get married, to have children, to manage their households, and to give the enemy no opportunity for reproach. Specifically, he talks about younger widows, and he does mention that older widows might choose to remain, and he would prefer if they remain single, but he issues no command on that. If you are widowed, can you be remarried? You may. You don't have to be, but you can. Matthew 5.32, Jesus says, Now it was said, whoever sends his wife away is to give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So that except for statement, right? Sexual immorality, I think that gives us another exception. If you divorce someone because of some sort of sexual immorality, you are free to remarry. His rule here is if you get divorced and people start remarrying, that these acts, they're a violation of the marriage covenant and are a type of of adultery, but he gives an exception. If there is sexual immorality in the marriage beforehand, the marriage is already broken and divorce is acceptable. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 7, which we already read, if the unbelieving one is leaving, let him leave. The brother or sister is not enslaved or is not bound in such cases. Rather, God has called you peace. So if you are abandoned by your spouse, divorce is acceptable. Are there other situations in which divorce may be acceptable? I think so, but I can't point to a Bible verse that explicitly says it. And so for the most part here, I'm just going to try and keep my mouth shut. Are there other situations where remarriage is acceptable? And I think so. My soft rule, again, just my interpretation, is if the marriage if the divorce, sorry, if the divorce was biblically justified, that remarriage is permitted. So if you're widowed, you may remarry. If you are divorced for a biblically justified reason, you are permitted to be remarried. There's one other thing that I want to specifically draw attention to here that I think is important. And I hope I'm not going out too much on a limb here. In Matthew 5, Jesus says that if someone divorces their spouse, specifically talking to men, it would have been very difficult for women to secure a divorce. That's why he's talking to men. If someone divorces their spouse for an unjustified reason, he makes them commit adultery. The person who is blamed for the adultery of remarriage is not the person who was divorced, but the person who did the divorcing. So I think if you are divorced for an unjustified reason, but you did not initiate that divorce, you tried to restore the marriage, you pursued reconciliation, and your spouse was unwilling, I think you're free to remarry. That sin was not yours. And any sin in the future, that adultery of remarriage, is not on your head, but on the person who ended your marriage. I think. Now, I would be remiss to not mention, we'll get to that in a second, to not mention that there is one situation that seems explicitly to be mentioned in Scripture where remarriage is sinful. Jesus says it himself. In a verse, actually, that we've already read in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Again, he's speaking to men here because it would have been much easier for men to get divorced. The rule here seems to be 
if you divorce someone, you initiate the divorce, you follow through, you refuse to be reconciled, and you divorce someone, and then go and remarry, that your action of remarriage is sinful. I can't see another way to understand that verse. And I just feel like it would be wrong of me to not point to it, to not mention it. But also, maybe we should add a little bit of an asterisk here. Not contradicting what Jesus said at all, but saying, if you were in that situation, you divorced your previous spouse for an unbiblical reason, and you've already been remarried. Stay in your current marriage. Any sin or wrong in the past is in the past. Ask for forgiveness and do your best to follow Jesus' instructions from this point forward. Believe it or not, I have heard preachers claim that if you were remarried after divorcing for an unbiblical reason, that you should divorce your current spouse. That is not what God desires. Marriage is a covenant between you and your spouse that is meant to last a lifetime. And if you screwed up in the past, then fine, you screwed up in the past. Do your best to live faithfully now. Okay? Okay. Ultimately, it boils down to something that I mentioned earlier, that marriage is about commitment. If and when it is possible, maintain your marriages. Fight through the difficult times where those emotions aren't as warm and fuzzy as they used to be. If this is your operating system for your marriage, that I'm going to be committed no matter how I feel, no matter what happens. I'm going to remain committed to this person, and through my commitment to them, I'm remaining committed to God. We're probably going to be okay. Now, I know this was really heavy. Let me pray a little bit, and then we'll move on with our service. Lord, thank you for challenging us, pushing us towards commitment. Help us to love our spouses, those of us who are married or will be married. Help us to love our spouses deeply. For those of us who are unmarried, help them to encourage those of us who are married, to spur us on towards greater faithfulness. Help us to be a community that supports one another, whether in our marriage or in our singleness. In all the situations we are placed in in life, help us to be faithful to you, to obey your word strictly, and to see it all as an opportunity to glorify you. Jesus, in your name we pray, and for your kingdom we